you can work yourself to debt and not necessarily become successful. Hey guys, welcome back to another founder interview. Uh, we're in lockdown today. I'm here with Henrik Waterlin from Bark, uh, and uh, yeah, he's built a very, very large subscription box company. He has a lot to share around building a successful e-commerce business. So uh, yeah, look, Henrik, thanks so much for taking the time. Thanks for having me on. You're welcome. So. Uh, uh, we were saying offline, um, unfortunately, we didn't get to catch up in person and do this. Um, but uh, yeah, look, um, the first question I have for everyone that comes on is, how did you get your job? <laughs> the good thing about being an entrepreneur is you don't have to apply for much, right? You just have to be an idiot that tried to start something that everybody else thinks is idiotic at the time. Um, so I guess... I, I got the job because my co-founders and me uh, kind of was hanging out and we wanted to build something nice with people we liked and and we stumbled over building cool stuff for dogs and uh, and yeah they haven't kicked me out since. Yeah, wow. So when did when did Bark originally Bark Box right? Yeah, like originally BarkBox, uh, well, BarkBox is still around. It's still our, diff our biggest product line. Uh, since then, we've kind of um, started to launch other products and services. And so now uh, the, the holding company is Bark, but the uh, the product line, one of the big product lines, BarkBox, we have Super Chewer, we have Bark Bright, we have Bark Essentials, we have a number of other things. So yeah, we started, uh, I guess, like I think officially, we started 2012. Uh, probably started to work on the project in 2011, um, and then we launched kind of like early in the year for 2012. So we've been up and running for I don't know eight years or so. Yeah, wow. And you guys like you guys are very very well known in the space. Like uh, how like is this your first business? No, uh, well it's not my first business. I've been. You know, I'm an old man. You know, uh, I started back in the very early days of the internet. Back then, this is way too old for you. Like it used to be called FidoNet, and there was like the internet was you used uh, services like Gopher and Veronica. And so uh, I, uh, I was lucky enough that I was I'm kind of like young enough to have had my career using technology, but kind of old enough to have been one of the first that kind of started to use technology. And so. I guess uh, I guess uh, I've been around the block for a little bit. Mm, I see. So, how did you come up with the idea for Barkbox? I mean, like I think, counter to many other people, it wasn't that we Barkbox was this big idea that we thought would be a billion dollar business. Um, I think it was, you know, Matt and I who who started working on it a few months before Carly joined us. Um, had built businesses before um, and kind of had raised venture capital. And I think at the time, we were a little bit kind of just wanted to build something that would be a little small kind of hustle that we didn't, where we didn't have to raise capital. Uh, and, and so uh, Matt and I met, and this is a true story, in a hot shape bed on a cruise ship um, because uh, we were on a, we were on this conference, and if you took the cheap ticket, you would be automatically merged or uh, matched with somebody else, like just to share like the the room, and uh, and they you know obviously because you didn't know people, they kind of pushed the bed apart. But I thought it'd be hilarious to put these beds back together, so I uh, I was checked into the room first, put the beds together, went out for some drinks, and that then came in after. You know, went to bed before me, and so the first time I ever meet my co-founder, I'm meeting this strange man <laughs> that I've never met before, lying in this hardship bed in a cruise ship. Um, so we then started to brainstorm about building businesses, and Matt had built this business called Meetup.com, which is a pretty famous business over here in the U.S. Uh, and and is this fascinating man uh, and and pretty quickly we realized that we shared a lot of the same values when it came to business building um and so um yeah we were just kind of shooting the shit and and kind of thought it would be fun to to do something with dogs because i was adopting dogs at the time and matt was kind of like ha have this great dane called hugo 
And so, uh, yeah, like the idea was kind of like, hey, let's do something with dogs. Couldn't we put like a box together with some cool things? And, and it wasn't kind of too thought through an idea. And then uh, I built the first version over a weekend and then we started to show it to friends and they were like, oh, that's awesome. I'll sign up when you're ready. And we were – well, we have Square on our phone. We could just take your money right now. And so uh, I think the first 70 account was kind of like us just swiping credit cards on our phones without us having anything else than just a, a WordPress site that didn't really work. Yeah, wow, well, interesting. And then how did you guys meet Kylie? So Kylie uh, was so – Matt. Uh, and I were both entrepreneurs and residents at these venture funds. And Matt was running a kind of an incubation space called Dog Patch Labs here in New York City. Um, and and I that was a venture firm called Polaris. I feel I think that were financing that people could come and sit there for some months. Um, and Matt was kind of running that. I was running something called Prehype. Uh, and he uh, and Kali was kind of like knew a lot of the people that was kind of uh, in that space. I think she was playing soccer with them. Uh, and so after we've you know found out that was 70 people who wanted our product, we were like, hey, now we actually have to do it. Uh, that sounds like a lot of work. And Kali is this force of nature. And she had just started Uber in New York. So she was, I think, the first hire in, in, in Uber uh, setting up the New York operations and she wanted to kind of start her own business. And so, uh, yeah, we lured her to, uh, to hang with us. And so that's how we met her. Yeah. Wow. Interesting. And you know, you guys, are one of like, like best known for as being like one of the fastest, uh, you know, American growing, uh, pet companies like in the world, in like, like, so, what do you think has caused that? Was that luck? Was it always like that after the first 70 or was it just pure brilliance? Pure ship? brilliance. It's pure brilliance. No, I, I think you're right. I think there's a lot of luck. Uh, and I, and I think it was luck, not just because timing was right, but, um, I've, a lot of things happened that kind of panned out well for us. Uh, we, the pet industry at the time had not really seen a lot of innovation. People were not really taking it serious. Uh, there was a startup in the first kind of dot-com wave. I think it was called pets.com that raised a lot of money, money got a lot of flat, like, and then closed down. And, and so I think it was considered one of those kind of industries that people didn't really want to touch. And so I think first we – we came into an industry that hadn't seen any innovation for a long time. There was hardly any startups in the space, uh, but it's a humongous industry. Like uh, every third household have a dog. And, and so uh, there's this very big industry and then and not a lot of players in it. Um, and so we kind of stumbled into that. I think secondly, we came in at a time where the, the, the people's relationship to their dogs were changing. And so – Dogs were no longer pets living kind of out in the yard. They were kind of invited in and becoming part of the family. And maybe because I have a background uh, from MTV um, where I used to run product development, we kind of took very much like a lifestyle approach to dog ownership pretty early. And so we started creating a lot of content and kind of like I think tapped into you know a culture that was already there but really didn't have a, a place to hang out, which were – Oh, everybody like me and Matt and Kali who who see dogs as as their kids, um, and and I think you know then we we were good of attracting a lot of quirky people that understood how to um, kind of use the internet as a tool for for custom acquisition, and so I think the technology was right, the timing was right, uh, you know our approach was right, and I think. All that with a ton of luck just made us kind of becoming um, what, what we always try to do is hopefully like the, a player in, in becoming kind of that defining brand for, for dogs. Yeah, I see. And like uh, did you guys end up raising VC? We, <laughs> we failed in our not trying to raise money. So we have raised – uh, money, I can't remember the exact number. It's kind of like in the $50 million range. Um, and we've done that over the last eight years. Um, I think, though, what have always happened is that we've always been a pretty frugal company. Uh, Matt and I have in our past raised a lot of capital for our companies. And I think 
learn that raising money doesn't necessarily mean that you're successful. And so I think one of the things which you know we're very fortunate about now is that we are we're a profitable company, um, and that obviously in a time where where like times are getting tougher, like is is a nice place to be because you can decide your own destiny. And so we haven't raised capital for I want to say four years or something like that. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess we're we're a little bit like of a of an old school conservative company when it comes to uh, to burning money. Yeah, no, that's interesting. So you would say you've gone full circle and if you had a choice for your next company, if you did, you know, launch another company, you would raise VC or you would not? I mean, like I'm not big on blanket statements. I think uh, I think com- I think founders need to find the company that fit them. Uh, and sometimes that is a bootstrap company. And I think sometimes that's a venture back company. And I think both are fine. Um there is, of course, the realization that you learned when you've done a few companies is that the second that you take venture capital, you put yourself on the track of making a very specific type of company. Um, and that is, you know, a high growth kind of a little bit of winner takes all uh, kind of like position. And so um, I always think that companies should just find out how they make a real solid solid business. Uh, the way that I kind of operate is I, I like to understand real pure unit economics. And I think if you then have a way of growing that much faster by getting capital, then you should go out and get it. Um, but I'm also like the type of businesses I am have been involved with and, and Bark, like it's a very, I would say like traditional business where we build a direct to consumer brand. Um, obviously if you build a technology company uh, or other forms of companies, then venture is probably the way to go. So I don't know. It's not a very sophisticated answer. I think I think you should be mindful about not taking capital if you don't know why you're taking it. And I don't think that raising capital in itself should ever be a success metric. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, talk to me around kind of these times because you made an interesting point that fortunately you guys are profitable and you're being – you know, you have the opportunity to be like a more older school business and be a bit more conservative. Um, you know, I'd love to hear your take and comment on these particular times. Have you guys been affected? Uh, what are you doing to, to tackle this? I mean, like these are obviously very scary times for a lot of companies. And I think us too, um, there is every day there is a new big risk that could suddenly uh, make your company kind of like uh, – be in real trouble. And so we're definitely uh, mindful of that and are constantly kind of looking at everything from supply chain to weakening in the market to, you know, all these different things like banks, you know, like uh, um, suddenly kind of like changing terms. Um, And so, you know, I don't think that we are out of the weeds. We have the advantage right now that uh, the pet industry historically is a recession proof industry. And at this point, it looks like people uh, still is looking to get our product and we sell it primarily online. Um, and so, um, so I think we are in a, in a decent shape right now, but uh, it's definitely scary times for everybody. From your experience, because you've built companies, uh, you know, previous to Bark and sounds like you're pretty, uh, I could say a bit of a, you know, you've got that experience. Um, would there be anything that you would be thinking about or, or would like to share with our audience around how they should be thinking about things at a time like this? Like what kind of mindset uh, do you have as a founder right now? Well, the good thing about being a founder is that you're nervous all the time. <laughs> and so <laughs> you don't necessarily uh, – you're kind of used to being in a situation where everything is un- uncertain and, and where you have high-level anxiety. So I guess like – we have a little bit of a, a head start on that. Um, I mean, like, again, like some industries are just completely hit, right? If you're in entertainment or you're in, you know, businesses like uh, hospitality, there is not a, a lot you can do because people, for obvious reasons, kind of will not be able to use your product. And it's very tough. And you will probably have to go through what a lot of founders have gone through as part of their career and that is letting people go or 
basically just realizing that the thing that you had dreamt about becoming very big won't be. And I think that is a very uh, traumatic uh, experience for everybody. Um, and you also will have a lot of staff that is very concerned about their jobs and, and things like that. And so I don't think necessarily there is like a, a universal piece of advice. I mean, like I feel that if you have strong integrity and you are honest for your staff and you try to be optimistic, but you're, you know, telling people as it is, I think um, if nothing else, they will respect you for that. Um, and so I think that's the only thing I, I, I will say, though, that as a founder, a lot of people look at how you conduct yourself. And so it's important not to lose yourself. And so. I would give the advice that I think I give advice to entrepreneurs at all times, and that is making sure that you stay in a good headspace, make sure you get to work out a bit, make sure that, you know, install that headspace app or whatever you're using to kind of make sure that uh, you don't kind of go crazy yourself because a lot of people's kind of jobs and, and mood is greatly affected by how you conduct yourself on, on Zoom or on video conference every day. Um, but I don't know. I don't think necessarily I have a, a magic wand that or a piece of advice that that is super helpful in this in these times. Yeah, no, that's fair enough. Because um, I'm always really interested in mindset. Like one time I met somebody and they said to me, you know, if you want to build a hundred million dollar company, uh, well, let's just say hypothetically, let's just say you want to build a twenty million dollar company. If it's already done in your mind, like and you believe that you can do it, you're fifty percent of the way there. Do you agree with that statement? You know what? I think there's different ways that people think about this. Um, I think my co-founders, they are very goals orientated. Like they see something and they go for it. And, and they, and I think that is very helpful. And I think for a lot of people, that is a very good way of yeah, having your mental model. I think for me, it's a little bit different. I'm more of a, like, I call like means or environment orientated person. I I kind of like try to make sure that I'm good headspace. I try to work with the smartest people I can gather around me. And I kind of like, but I don't necessarily know where, what then will come out of it. And so it's a little bit of like, if you make sure that you have all the different components, all the ingredients are, are fine, then something's good is gonna, yeah, like be created at the end of the day. But I'm not in the same way as other people are where I say, like, I want to build a $100 million company or I, I want to hang with people that are kind and smart and quirky and I want to build cool shit that the world needs. And then I hope I make a lot of money doing it. But I, I kind of like it's not the other way around. And I think ironically for me, it wasn't really until I started to think that way that I started to make stuff that actually worked. Before, when I was just chasing cash, it was always I always ended up kind of building stuff that was too late or, you know, like just didn't work because I was changing the cash instead of chasing understanding a problem that the customer had and finding a good solution for it. Yeah, no, that's a that's an interesting take. Um, so when it comes to mindset, the things that you're doing is mainly kind of things around just like meditation, working out and just. Yeah, like I, it's not like I'm a chubby Danish boy, so I'm not sure necessarily <laughs> like I <laughs> – it makes it sound like I'm all fit. Um, I do think that, you know, I'm 44 now. I've been building companies most of my career, and so I guess I've, I've done it a few times. And I've definitely learned that um, you can work yourself to debt and not necessarily become successful. Uh and so I'm probably taking more the stand of like making – make sure if you choose to be an entrepreneur, you are statistically likely to fail. It's going to be hard, hard work. And so make sure that you go through that journey with people you like and make sure you build something that you can be bothered thinking about every day because that almost like the byproduct of being an entrepreneur is kind of like the value like that everybody – is jealous of. Yes, they're also jealous when you're successful and you make the money or envious or, or impressed. Um, but it is like choosing who you can work with, choosing who you work with, choosing at what hours you work that a lot of people would like to, uh, to emulate. And so make sure that you do that. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And 
you said something that was interesting to me around kind of surrounding yourself with like really nice people, good people, kind people, and some of the smartest people. Um, that that makes sense, but how does like how how does that work in practice, right? Like, what do you do to do that? Like when you say like <laughs> like you know, let's just say you said in the early days of Bark, you you met some really you you brought on some really quirky cool people like is there anything there on like the hiring front that you could share from your experience when it comes to finding really really smart great people i mean i think different companies have different dna and i have definitely seen very very successful company that are very aggressive are filled with like just killer types and that is great for them and there are businesses out there that yeah like a very, very large business is building culture like that. That is just not how I am. And so I wouldn't thrive in that specific culture. And so the type of organizations that I try to be part of or I try to make are one that's a little bit more m- mirrored over the types of environment that I prefer to be in and the one that I kind of enjoy. Yeah. So I will say that I probably emphasize um, – gelling and connecting with people that I work with a lot, specifically in the early days, because I know that when you build an organization, the DNA that you set in a company in the first, let's say, 20, 30 hires is very often the culture that you'll see when you are then 300, uh, because people hire people who have the same values as themselves. And so um, I, I have the joke internally that I'd rather hire somebody that I like than somebody who is competent, uh, which is obviously a joke. But like the, but there is a little bit of like the meaning to, you will have to call people on the weekends and you'll have to have very difficult conversation with people, and so you might as well have choose people where you think that conversation is going to be not as difficult as if it's somebody that you don't have a good rapport with. Um, and so, uh, and I think the quirkiness is maybe just because Matt, Kali, and I are quirky people ourselves. And so um, that was, a, but also like we work in, we work about making dogs happy, right? Like it's not, it's not a very killer industry, right? It's about having empathy and, and, and loving animals and, and really kind of like being the people that the dogs think we are, which, uh, seem to be like superhumans that we're not really, but like at least my dog always think that I'm awesome. And, and so I'd like to, to, to be that person. Yeah, that's cool. I'm curious. Someone asked me this question the other day and I'd love to hear your take around kind of like with your team and like, are you really good friends with, with like people in your team or how do you, how do you maintain that kind of, do you want to maintain that, that like, uh, you know, there is a difference in, in kind of hierarchy or anything like that. Like, what's your take there? Like, you don't, do you want to be the boss or do you want to ever be perceived as the boss? Or, yeah. I, I mean, that. like, I, yeah, yeah. Like, I, I, I don't think so. Like, I, but again, I think it's just up to the individual. I think Matt, Kali, and I always really enjoy that people treat us like the interns, right? Like, and that, You know, there's no need to have like specific kind of like respect because that we were the first one through the doors. Uh, We try to kind of like be very approachable and and not create that leveling. And and so uh, to answer a few of your questions, like I, 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 we definitely try not to create any type of specific kind of allure around us. Um, And Maybe it's because of its own insecurities, but uh, and I think, but I think it has allowed us to ha- have a lot of, of very smart, very talented people around us because, um, and very autonomous people around us because they really do what they think is best for the business. Now, obviously, when a company grows, and and I and so to the so that's to like how people see us. Um, I think to how working with friends. I think in the early days, obviously, we were very close to people because we were sitting. And working together all the time. I think as you kind of mature and you grow as your company, the type of people who come into your organization and the type of relationship that you need to have with people is diff- going to change in nature. Uh, yes, you are friendly, but you're not necessarily 
like I think I always see people as my friends, but I also realize that I have a dual role. I am both somebody that I hope that they feel um, that they can trust, but I'm also somebody who have like different decision making in their career and if they have a job or not and stuff like that. And I, I don't, I think I learned as I was getting, as I got older that you have to honor that you ha you can't be the one who's there at the end of the holiday party because people are drunk and they will say stuff to you that they will regret at the end of the, uh, the next day. And it is on you to make sure that you don't put them in that situation. And so I do think that, yes, you can be friendly, but you also have to realize that um, in, often you are people's boss and, and, uh, and that is your responsibility to make sure that that is honored. Um, and I would say like the, uh, the, the third thing is that I think as you then get bigger, then people start to, they don't know you that well. And so they're like more folklore kind of comes into place where people see all, oh, you know, this is the CEO or there's the founder. And then suddenly I think you're seen as more of a thing that you might even think yourself, but just because the people don't know that, you're just making the shit up as you go along. They think that you know more or are smarter than you are, and therefore they prescribe kind of like more authority to that, I think. Yeah, no, that's funny how you said like around making shit up as you go along. Like, you, like you, you've, you've had incredible success uh, as a company and as a leader, uh, but um, you've still been making shit up as you go along, and that's the case for everyone, right? Nobody really knows what they're doing. They just pretend, yeah? Oh. Yeah, and like obviously when you've done it a few times, you have experience at least what not to do, but no, I think you're right. Like, I was I was fortunate. I was pretty young, and, and I became uh, head of product development for MTV International, mm -hmm. and I was in my 20s. And I remember once sitting at this meeting with a bunch of CTOs for big companies that was big at the time, like Ericsson. And like these were like big compact, like these were companies that were very large at the time. Um, and I was sitting there with people who are much older than me. And I was like, oh, no, I hope they don't realize that I don't know shit and I'm making all this stuff up. And then suddenly I looked around and was like, hey, wait a minute. They are all just making all this stuff up. They don't know anything about this stuff. And I think I, that's always kind of like stayed with me. And I think. Now, obviously, I'm more secure and I feel more certain in some of the decisions that I make because I've tried more things. But sometimes when people – sometimes I, I feel that people assume that you've thought much more about stuff and you've definitely thought about it. But a lot of times you are just taking decisions based on your experience and you don't know if it's the right or the wrong thing and you just hope that you're right. Yeah, 100%. And that kind of brings me to like – like another thing that I've learned as, across speaking to many different founders is is the reflection of, of where you are right now is, is a reflection of, of the decisions you've made thus far to get there. And you don't have to be right 100% of the time, but would you say you have to be right like 60, 70% of the time? You know, I think often these things are not that binary. You, you make decisions and they kind of like gives you new options. And those options can kind of be better or less good. Um, and so, I mean, like I was fortunate enough with Matt and Carly that they know a lot about things that I don't know much about. And without them, you know, like I, I sit a lot on the creative side of the business and I feel pretty comfortable about a lot of the decisions I make there. A lot of the decisions that I made in their fields, I have no idea. And I just trust that they make great decisions. As per kind of like brand building and product development and stuff like that, I think I feel pretty confident in a lot of the methodology that I developed over time. Um, and I feel pretty comfortable about being vulnerable about the decisions where I don't have enough information or knowledge or experience to make a clear call. And there I feel that now we have a good team where we can talk it out and saying, I don't know if this will work, but you know, like here's like the here's the components of it that I think uh, seem to be working. Here's like the area that I'm not sure about, and so what do what do people around the room think? And 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 so um, so I feel like if you 
vulnerability doesn't have to be weakness and and if you can if you feel if you're comfortable enough in your own skin and your own decision making to be vulnerable when you have something that you're not certain about i find often in dialogue with your colleagues you can get to a pretty good decision yeah it's kind of being self-aware and in tune and being like yeah just kind of trusting your gut as well yeah 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 and at one point, you just have to make a decision. Sometimes, like taking a bad decision. I used to make this joke. I, I at MTV, I ran a lot of creative directors, and I didn't. Um, I don't have a design background. And now, like through my last twenty years career, I often sit in a role where I have to make final calls on designs. And there, are, and so I used to make the joke uh, about consistency of saying it doesn't really matter that you designer X, you know, has better taste than I have. You know, it's consistency is more important than taste. Um, and at least I have consistently bad taste. And so if we just always follow my taste, then it'll be consistent. Uh, but, and I think there's some truth to that. Like if, if you look at brands, for example, that I think are strong, it is because that customers understand what they will get when they interface with them and that is all about consistency and then even something that doesn't look visually as stunning if it's consistently that way then i think people feel comfortable about it so when you talk about branding and you know the bark brand you guys have done very very well what what are some key elements there which you think have built that brand that you've strategically kind of finessed into the consistently over time in the past, you know, eight years plus? I think we always had taken a stand of what we call the inside out brand. And what I mean by that is that we have some pretty, we only hire people who love dogs a lot. (laughs) And we always uh, have very good intentions. Um, And so I feel what have happened and we've always given a lot of our staff pretty big authority to do whatever they wanted to do with the brand. And so in many ways the brand have is this kind of cook up that we've done together as a group. And I think a few things have happened because that we developed it kind of collectively we always kind of like seemed very authentic when we were talking to people. Because when you call our customer service team, you're talking to somebody who probably sits with a dog on their lap. And when you read one of our Facebook comments, uh, you read somebody who is there because they love dogs. And so I always felt that authenticity that we've had on our mission of making dogs happy was kind of like very pure all the way through. Now, sometimes that means because that we just always let everybody kind of like on the, in the last mile – have a lot of authority in what they could do. Sometimes it's not that pretty. Like sometimes I'll see a logo being done in a bad way, or sometimes somebody will do something on social, and I'm like, ah, that's probably a little bit outside what I had hoped we would do. Um, but because that it all come, I think, from good intentions, like we've always kind of gotten away with it. Um, and so. I think just being very approachable and just really being very respectful of of the core problem that we're trying to solve and being very kind of like aligned with our customers and that we're all here just to make dogs happy, um, I think have allowed us to talk to them in kind of like eye level where I think a lot of other brands kind of like talk down to them or they shout at them or they keep themselves very glossy and beautiful even though on the inside they're not and so i think we've always taken a little bit of what you see is what you get yeah level of humbleness yeah i think you know we we serve our customers you know like uh, we have a we have a team called the happy team so we talk about a th- we talk to about a third of our customers every uh, every month yeah, wow. and we obsess about having a chat with them um, and the team that talks to them is called the happy team. And the happy team is led by this guy called Hanan. And he always talks about uh, hiring people who have a servant's heart. Um, and now I'm from Denmark, which is like a very equal society. And so the whole terminology of a servant is not something we have. We don't have servants in Denmark. You go into a restaurant, like the bartender will give you a little bit of like, you know, don't try and think that you're anything bigger than me because like we're the same like it's a very very uh level society Mm. and so like when he started to talk about hiring people who had a servant's mentality i was like you know it took me a long time to really compute right um and i think what he had managed to do is really attract a lot of people who truly get very happy by seeing other people get happy 
Like it, they just really would like to help. Like the hospitality is embedded into their DNA. And that's why I've, one of the reasons why our team, our happy team sits in Columbus, Ohio, which is in the Midwest here in the US, where you just have a culture of being very kind and nice and humble. You know, where in New York, we're a little bit more like, hey, you know, what's your problem? Like, and, and so, and so I think, uh, I think the habit team have really taught the rest of us a lot about like, how do you just make sure that you are uh, very respectful and, and it is something to be very proud of if you can serve your customer, uh, customer as well. Yeah. Wow. So if you speak to a third of your customers every month, like how many, like in terms of scale, how many is that? Like that, how many, like that's big numbers. Yeah. I think we probably have 200 ish people sitting in Columbus, Ohio wow. with a dog on their lap and texting frantically pictures back and forth for, for our customers. And like, we, we're, we're happy to talk to them about anything. Like we'll be sending them texts, like does your dog sleep on its back on its paws? And, when people, you know, when people's friends get too tired of getting pictures of their dogs, like we're always there to, to kind of like have a good chat about that. And so, uh, but in many ways, like that business, that, that comp, uh, that part of our business is not a customer service team only, like it's our research team. It's the people who can tell us what products we should build next because people tell them what products they should build. Like, and when we do something dumb, you know, these are the ones who have a relationship and saying, hey, we're sorry, we sent you the wrong toy. Like, that's on us. Let us send you a new one. Um, and so the, we feel that like the happy team is really the heart of our organization. Um, and it's the one that informs a lot of the decisions that we make. Yeah, that's really, really smart. That's a genius initiative. Because yeah, sometimes I feel within even my own company that um, it's good even for me to get in on, you know, like, um, the, like the help desk and answer, answer tickets, answer questions, see what's going on. And I always find it so fascinating. And it, it made me realize, yeah, we need to get this, like any of this customer service, speaking to our customers, supporting our customers. We need to get that through to our product and our marketing team because it's so key. Like the fact that you guys speak to a third of your customers and I assume you have in the, the millions, maybe even tens of million subscribers, like uh, what, what kind of scale are we talking? What can you share? I mean, like we have a uh, shy of like, I think we probably ship 2 million boxes by now. Like, so we have, you know, under a million subscribers, but like close to, close to a million. I don't know the exact number. Otherwise I would share it with you. Um, but let's say like it's, 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 uh, shy of a million subscribers. And so, yeah, we would talk to 300,000 customers a month. Um, and, and I think, and I think you're totally right. Like there's this irony that we talk about trend analysis and forecasting and product development and roadmaps. At the end of the day, our job is to understand what are the problems we can solve for our customers. And very often, they'll just tell us, right? And so we don't have to kind of be that academic about it. We just have to ask them. And if I look at some of the most successful product lines that we created, for example, we have a, we have a business line called Super Chewer, uh, which is like more active for more active dogs, like more durable toys, like rubber-based to toys. Mm. And, you know, it wasn't too difficult to come up with when suddenly your customer call and saying, hey, all these plush toys that you send me, my dog chewed them up in like 30 seconds. And we're like, hey, wait a minute, maybe we should make some toys that they don't chew up in 30 seconds. And then we send them, you know, some toys and we say, hey, would you kindly tell us what you think about them? And they say, this one is good, this is bad. And by now, I think we ship like 100 million products and we have net promoter schools on all of them. And so if you then take that kind of like empathy and you mix that with an obsession of data collection, suddenly you know what a six-year-old Labrador in Texas really like because you just have been through enough of these conversations to give you a pretty good statistical kind of prediction of what this doc would like. And then obviously we can use that intelligence to go back and saying, hey, you have this at this doc. We think that they really might like this product. Mm, yeah, that's genius. So you guys obviously started as BarkBox, but then you've kind of opened up, made Bark the parent brand, and you've if you've bolted on other product lines to to service this customer base, but then also have a, a more wide range offering to bring in other people that might not be interested in Bark Box as an example. That's a very smart strategic move and it's a way to grow, but focus is key. 
And how do you know when to move into the next product line or just keep crushing and, you know, like doing really well on the one? Yeah, you know what? Like this is where I might be a little bit contrarian on that. I actually on Tuesday I have a book coming out called The Acorn Method um, about this specific topic. And uh, and that is because I think philosophically we have for 50 years heard focus is key. I think the reality is and, – and so what I did was I was looking at some of these companies that was very successful, you know, the Apple of the world or the Amazon or, or even companies like ourselves. Mm. And what I think I s- noticed was like trees, at one point when a product line matures, it just can't grow any further. And so the way that trees have learned to develop over, ye- over the years is not to become a much bigger tree but to become a forest. And so if you take Apple, for example, they used to be a desktop company, then be, they became a music player, then they became a phone company, and now they're a product, like a services and entertainment company, or trying to be that. And so I think my view is that, yes, you should be very brutal about the discipline, about not kind of like starting to do everything, mm. but you should experiment a lot. And when you experiment, you find... Uh, exponential ways of growing or of uh, offering a better service. And then you should be keep doing that, but you should keep experimenting. And so I think where I, where I would counter a little bit what you said is that I'm on the business building belief that you should grow your, your service onto a specific maturity. Yes. But then like trees, you should think about how do I regenerate myself? What is my system for keep kind of like be growing? And sometimes that is not just growing, you know, further up. That is about growing wide. Um, and so that's the the business strategy that we've had. Interesting. And what compelled you to write the Acorn Method? <laughs> I think you know I've had like um I have two organizations that I'm involved in. Obviously, Bark, which is the one that I you know, spend the last eight years on. But I'm also part of an organization called Prehype, which is kind of a, a collective of, of entrepreneurs. And they teach uh, through that organization. I teach at business schools and and um, and I advise kind of large companies on how do you become more entrepreneurial. And I think what I noticed was that uh, over the last uh, 10 years or so, companies are trying to grow. Um, and they're spending a lot of money doing it, but they don't seem to be very successful. In fact, most of the Fortune 500 companies are staying in the Fortune 500 index for shorter and shorter period of time. And so there's this kind of like fascinating kind of things happening where corporate innovation spend 10x what venture capital does, but the companies are growing slower and slower. And and so I kind of cut up obsessed about trying to understand what was that and and uh, after having kind of like been on the advisor side for 10 years doing that I was like well maybe I should take at least the ideas and and the learnings that I've had there and then share them as kind of like the beginning of a conversation about how does companies keep growing um, specifically in uncertain times where uh, you know, other startups will come in and try to compete against you or technology companies will come to you or something in the world kind of changes. So suddenly, like, uh, the world is more uncertain. Uh, I feel that companies need to find ways of retaining that entrepreneurial and experimental muscle uh, so they can keep growing. Yeah, no, that's really interesting. So you're all about going wider. Well, still go deep, but go wider when you can. Yeah, I think, you know, I'm on – Making sure that the core works, like the the core tree has to kind of like stay tall and be robust. Mm. But at one point, you are not going to get exponential growth of putting another branch on. You're going to get exponential growth about creating a system where you can pluck an acorn or a bunch of acorns around fertile ground. And then you have to be very disciplined about not over-investing in any of them that is not basically growing straight up. Now – one of them might grow straight up so fast that at one point that tree will become bigger than the tree that kind of like incubated it as to as it were. And that is fine because you would 
be owning that business line. And I think that is what Apple and Amazon and a lot of other companies have managed to do, retaining that entrepreneurial and experimental model um, so that they can keep eclipsing themselves um, by building new that became bigger than what they had originally. Yeah, no, I think that's that's spot on. I think about this as well, like even in, in our company, because, um, you know, we started off as a magazine and, uh, and now we're kind of moving into uh, not just magazines, but online education. Um, and, you know, we've been doing that for a few years now. And now, you know, we're going to do we're going to go deeper there. But when I think of vertical or going wider, you know, I'd love to build like a SaaS company or something, a, a, a you know, a series of tools that help founders. And I think that's really smart. It's just right from my own experience, um, it's very, very difficult to know how to make sure you don't get distracted. And is it a shiny object yeah. versus, uh, you know, sticking to the core, maintaining the core and all of that. And that's, it's such a fine balance from, from personal experience. What a nice pluck for me to talk about the book. Uh, I think you're totally right. And I think that is why it's important. That, and I think that is one of the big issues that companies have. How do you make sure that you don't suddenly take the focus from like the organization that are basically paying your bread and butter and then kind of like moving over to the new shiny object? And so a few thoughts. Um, you need to first, I think, be very good at figuring out what is basically your equivalent of the acorn. And I think what's important is that it's something that's standalone and it's something that is not part of your current organization. And so the way that we, because you're based in Australia, you know, we, we've, um, one of the business line we have that is growing very fast for us is, um, is a business uh, called, it's our home line, it's called the essential line. It's beds and pee pads and poo bags and stuff like that. And we're selling them primarily on Amazon. And so Whitney, who runs that, used to be an entrepreneur. She built a business, uh, didn't have big success with that and was kind of like looking, trying to figure out what to do next. And so we asked her to basically figure out what she would do with Amazon. Now, we kind of like put her on the side we said, basically, you can't use any of the tech resources you have. You're basically on your own. But if you have specific thing you need from us, you can come and ask for it, and we'll make sure they clean that. And so Kali kind of like and her went off to the side and built this like double digital, double, double digit million dollar business line like in 12 to 18 months just by kind of like using a lot of the assets, but not interfacing at all with our core organization. And so like an acorn, we kind of dropped it in a place where we thought well, there was fertile ground, which for us was about building essential products for, for dogs and selling them on Amazon. And we definitely then had like, if you'd like a root system so that there was like connecting tissue, um, but we gave it a lot of autonomy and a lot of independence so that it didn't kind of go in and remove the, the, the focus. And we basically said to everybody, you can't deal with Whitney. Basically, she is in control. She calls the shot, you know, tech team, legal team, brand team, all these other team, like this is like off limit for you. Now, we've done that before where it didn't work. We launched a vet on, the, on wheels business. Uh, and and so we constantly look at building these new business lines. And the way that we look at it is we take an autonomous team, we put it somewhere we think there's fertile ground, we give them a certain amount of, of resources. And if they run out of those resources, basically they're default dead. And so it's not where we just keep throwing money at it because like, you know, oh, we just give them a little bit more. Like if they're out of money, they're out of money. And so I think in the same way as the acorn, which also comes with a little bit of fertilizer and a little bit of DNA from the mother tree, you know, and some very strict rules about growing straight and up. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we have tried to kind of like emulate a model where we can get those two, both, both those two worlds. We can get the entrepreneurial fast grow, but we can also kind of like make sure that they don't interface with the mothership. Yeah, no, that makes sense. That's, um, that's really cool to hear. Do you have to, as a leader though, like, or even just Kylie, Matt, and yourself, make sure you guys don't get too kind of interested and in moving towards this new shiny thing because where your guys' attention flows, naturally your team, if what you guys are most excited about, naturally your team will be most excited about and 
and all that side of things? Like, how do you manage that? You know, you know what I mean? Yeah, totally. Well, I think it's all about being disciplined about it. Um, I think you're totally right. Like, uh, that, that does tend to happen. We have the luxury that we are three people so that we can kind of divide and conquer a little bit. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and Matt, uh, have, has, with that case, we're much more kind of like involved in the core and making sure that like we grew that organization into something that was very mature. Um, and then we have really smart people who kind of could help kind of making sure that we create kind of systems and, and scaffolding for the core thing. And so we don't have to sit there and 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 work on it every day we can we can invent systems that other people can take over um but i but i don't think there is i think you're totally right like when we start to kind of get excited about it then a lot of people want to be excited and we just have to be very disciplined uh about saying no this is this person is working on it they're the only person that's working on it nobody's invited nobody's on the email to the point where like uh, a lot of these teams, like Kali is doing this on another business line right now, and they have their own Slack. They have their own, like they're separate. Yeah. Like they have their own email. They're for all intended purposes, like completely on their own island. They have their own tech stack. Um, yeah, wow. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so not so, even shared um, services. No, because like I think sometimes you have this idea that the shared services is going to be really nice for the synergy, but the reality is that it just makes you run slower. Um and also, like the people who are responsible for making sure that the existing business that's working is working, you know, they have to be a little bit more conservative and they have to be more about protecting that than necessarily trying to invent new, where the new has to invent new all the time, right? You know, and they might want to use like, like at Bark now, we're such a big company, like the, the systems that we have to just move all these products that we send out every month around, like it's like huge systems and there's consultants coming in and making sure they talk to all the systems and there are accountants coming in and doing like, uh, you know, like auditing and all this stuff. Meanwhile, we're trying to invent something new over here, right? And they have to have the flexibility to just do whatever they want to do because I feel it's a bigger risk that you build something that the customer don't care about and that doesn't scale than it is that suddenly that we can't tie it into a, our system. Mm, so I'll, I'll, give, I'll give you an example. When we started BarkBox, everybody was asking me, how are you going to pack the boxes? And I always used to say, oh, we're going to pack them ourselves. And people thought, that won't scale. And I was like, I understand that it might be a problem, but the reality is I have 70 boxes. It'll take me about a good 20 minutes to pack. And so it scaled just fine. Like when we have a million boxes, we will have a robot and a 3PL and systems in place. But at that time, we also have shit out of revenue. And so therefore, we can kind of afford throwing money at it. And so sometimes people, I think, obsess about like the scalability of something before figuring out what is the magic, what is the service what is the product that the customers really love? If you can find that, then I feel often you can find a way of scaling that on the back of it. Yeah, love it. Um, so look, we have to work towards wrapping up, Henrik. Uh, this is a yep. great conversation. Question around kind of this idea of, yeah, bolt, like, you know, you, you, build, you, you, you focus on the core, you work out what your core is, then kind of, then you look to bolt on other products and or services but while, but while maintaining the core, um, like that's a good model. And I'm curious, every one of these new products that you guys, you know, new product lines that you guys launch, do you first always offer it to your existing customer base? Sure. Like we definitely, we, well, yes or no. We do what we call signal mining early on, uh, which is basically, can we get more data about, uh, if our thesis is right. And that might be that we send 200 emails to existing customers saying, hey, we're thinking about launching these specific products. What do you think? Mm -hmm. And that will give us like more indication. Sometimes if it's something specific, like we might use external tools. So let's make, uh, we have a business line. We have these poo backs and they have funny uh, words on them, like uh, funny uh, statements. So we have one I think called poopaganda. And so it's like make logs, not wool or we have like one with rap, rap titles like I love it when you call me Big Pooper um, now I don't have I don't have I don't know which one of the 60 funny statements that my 
creative team made were the best one. And so we just buy Instagram ads and we see what people click on. And so sometimes we do stuff like that. Now, the power, of course, of what we built at Bark now is that we are one of the only brands – sorry, we are the only brand in dog that touch in food, that touch in play, that touch in health, that touch in, in, uh, in home. And so we have brand permission now to play on like the whole gamut. And that allows us to – when we launch, for example, the Bark, Bright, Bark Bright, which is our new dental product, we can add it to our box and saying, hey, you probably don't brush the teeth of your dog. You know you should. You don't want to do that. So we built basically a super cool toothbrush that your dog can eat. Uh, and we built this – we found this amazing bio uh, – these enzymes through this bioengineering company that will basically break down all the bad things in your dog's mouth. You should just add that to your subscription and then kind of like buy that. Um, but I think that's back to the earlier point about the brand. Like, you know, I mean like some companies have brand permission to spread out. Like uh, if I told you that – Nike is making a new hotel, you probably would have an idea what that would be. But if I told you that Hilton is making a new shoe, you probably wouldn't know what that would be. And so some companies naturally are more uh, ha have bigger range in what they're allowed to do. Mm, interesting. When you attack kind of uh, – attack is probably not the best word. When you test a new product line and you kind of go off and incubate an, an idea or a hypothesis, build the MVP and whatnot, for, for you know, a lean startup F methodology one thing um i know that uh jeff bezos is big on i've done a little bit of it at founder is is finding people that have come from other companies that have tackled that particular space like if you're going like a totally different vertical but for a similar customer base do you do that do you look for people that have that experience yeah i think we Again, a little bit lucky because of our industry and nothing has been made there. And so we can often find people who've done something in a in a people space and try to attack in the same way. So a bunch of our toy designers uh, have come from a background of making kids toy yeah. because that they understand how do you understand how play is and then how do you create something that strengthens that kind of experience uh, so we definitely do some of that but sometimes we we take the posture that you have to invent something new and there we just go for very entrepreneurial people so people who are very good of being versatile so they know design development you know business development people who have agitation so just like they just have a chip on the shoulder like it's like they're constantly like you know um people who have great user empathy so they kind of like naturally think about like i wonder what the customer would think about that and so some of these are entrepreneurial kind of attributes that uh that you don't necessarily recruit because of your experience in a specific industry but you recruit because people have that specific personality uh, no i see okay interesting um well look Really mindful of your time. We'll work towards wrapping up. Last question. Two last questions. One. Uh, There's always three. No. All right. We'll go with three. <laughs> There's always three things. Right, we'll go with three. All right. You're getting <laughs> greedy. Okay. Uh, one, where's the best place people can find out more about yourself and your work and your new book? Yes. Uh, that is probably on Twitter. I'm at Wordlin, W-E-R-D-L-I-N. Um, and so that's probably where I, I – I brag the most about things that I'm working on, um, but they can also just email me or tweet at me and whatever. I'm I'm pretty pretty open door policy. Yep. And uh, Icon Method, when when that coming out? It's coming on. Uh, I don't know when this is going to be released. It's out on Tuesday the 28th. So this we're recording this on a Thursday. It's coming out next Tuesday. Um, so uh, maybe by the time that you've removed all the dumb things I said on this podcast and edited it out. And it's, you can go just search the acorn method, the acorn method .com, that there's a link uh, to the book there. Okay. Acorn method.com. And then second question, advice on anyone going through the pandemic, uh, experiencing their businesses, in some sort of uh, adversity, which we know probably majority would be um, advice there. Get a dog. <laughs> I mean, like, I, I don't know. Like, I think, I think we are all, I think we all need to have people around us 
that we can talk to. And so I think just make sure you don't like get too isolated by yourself, but make sure you Zoom call your friends and and talk to a few people because I think you can go nuts if you just sit there and try to compute the whole thing in your head. But I do say, I think saying getting a dog does help because at least you can talk to that. <laughs> awesome. Uh, and then give it a bar and then give it a bark box, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. And then last one is what's uh, what's exciting for you? Uh, what in the future? What's most exciting? I am excited about the the remote work that people start to do, and I think a resurgence. What I hope is going to be resurgence of entrepreneurship. Um, I think there is a lot of opportunity to build businesses and make money online. And I think this pandemic have taught us all that it's probably fine to work remote or to hire people who are remote. And so I think that makes uh, that makes it hard for a lot of people. But I think for people who probably listening to this podcast probably gives them an edge. And I think being an entrepreneurial person is probably one of the only skills which will transcend through all these different kind of like hot times uh, and new technology developments that's going to happen. And so I think becoming better and better of looking at problems and finding systems to solve those problems in a scalable way, which I think is the core of entrepreneurship, I think is probably one of the best things that people can be spending their time on. And and that's not just for making money, but that's also for solving the problems that we have in society and our communities and stuff like that. And so um, I'm excited for the people who probably are listening and, and, and reading your, your magazines and the content that you produce and, and the classes you guys do, because I do think that this entrepreneurship is like the skill of the future. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Awesome. Well, look, thank you so much for your time, Henrik. I, I won't take any more of it. You were very, very generous. It was a great conversation. And uh, yeah, thank you so much. I, I hope you stay safe in New York and I hope things get better soon. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me on. Thank you. The founder mission is to help you create an ass-kicking business and help you learn straight from the mouths of world-class founders. Get your free printed edition of Founder Magazine featuring Sir Richard Branson. Just cover shipping and handling at founder.com forward slash Branson.